do you want me to pipe in? Um, will it be obvious? It will be very obvious. Okay, I can live with that. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, then welcome to the Hockey Podcast. It is Kevin. I, Kevin, host of Agree or Disagree, the podcast. Follow me on Twitter at K-E-B-O-L-E, soundcloud.com, K-E-B-O-L-E, speaker.com, K-E-B-O-L-E, where you also will find Agree or Disagree, the podcast. Uh, and YouTube as well, Kevin Olenek. You can add me as a friend on Facebook. And you can link the Hockey Podcast on Facebook as well. And you can also follow the podcast, Hockey, as well. You know, there have been... A lot of interesting things that happens happened in the off season. Um, you know, we had the big signing of John Tavares, and we've talked about that. We've had out here in Vancouver, in the Vancouver area, there's a ton of excitement about what is going to happen with Quinn Hughes and the Vancouver Canucks. We've talked a lot about that. We spent some time talking about where the Pittsburgh Penguins is are, and there's a lot of teams making. A noise in a different way, but there's been a team that has been particularly busy. Now, we will get into this if this team has been effectively busy or just making change for the sake of change. Uh, but, because I think actually, if you presented both of those arguments, you could actually legitimately say, I don't know if I could say that you're wrong. I'm with me is uh, he's been on the podcast before, he is an avid Flames fan, as am I. I I am from Calgary. My flame, the Flames are the number one team that I cheer for. So we are going to do a season re- recap or kind of a recap of where the Calgary Flames are going, where they have been. They have had a rather tumultuous 2018, and we're going to talk about them. Connor Turner is joining us from the fine city of Burnaby, British Columbia. How is it going out there? It's going well, Kevin. It's really nice. I can't debate to the heat right now, so that's good. It is hot. It's out here. It's like plus 35 hot. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. So. Yes. Yes. Of course, it's the perfect time to talk about hockey in July. <laughs> of course. Of course. Uh, you know, I, I do have this up on the Twitter poll question. Um, and maybe we'll get into this, but the Twitter poll question that I have today, and I do uh, an Asian one every day, and it is, will the Calgary, which team will be better, the 2017-18 Calgary Flames or the 2018-19 Calgary Flames? And as of yet, so far, 71% of the people that have voted, which is only seven at this point, so you can go vote, uh, say yes. But let's look back. So I figure let's go look back, Connor, and let's go forward. Let's start with, of course, there was a lot of changes. Where were you on we needed to fire Glenn Gullickson? Were you, it was time for him to go, or did you want to give him another shot? I was personally in the give him another shot, but I wasn't too shocked when it did happen. I think it was in the cards. Um, I think being a Canadian franchise, there's a lot more pressure and a little less leeway with you know how teams perform. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles that the Flames have right now is the amount of pressure from fans and management and just the city in general as opposed to other teams in the NHL. Um, so I wasn't as convinced that the issues are with Glenn Gullison, but with the change, you know, I, I, I'm okay with Bill Peters. I think it's probably... Um, a good choice and we'll see how it all flows together. But, uh, you know, I'm okay with the choice that was made, even though it wasn't my first choice, but it seems like it's uh, probably the best one moving into the season. Yeah. It's, it's so because last year, and we'll get into this when we talk about the trade as well, but there (laughs) seemed to be this perception and a, a buddy of mine at, he talked about it in the first game of the first game of the year when they were playing in Vancouver, and he made this statement that the, the Gullison lost the locker room, and I kind of laughed and chuckled about it. But as the season wore on, you saw this guy throw sticks in the stands, um, and you just saw this team for some reason or another collapse. And I, I you may not be, you may be right; it may not have been Gullison. But it just, it just, I, I don't know. I don't know if Gullison inspired the confidence of the fans. 
And, I mean, you look back at that power play, it was atrocious. I The 1-3-1, one, one, they might as well, I don't understand what they were doing. And there was a lot not to like. But at the same time, it felt like maybe this just the Flames have had a history of solving their problem by changing their coaches and not necessarily making that a great coaching change. It's just change for the sake of making change. It's like a meh and not making something serious. And I feel to me, I don't know if Bill Peters is an upgrade of Glenn Gullickson. Yeah, I think that's a lot of the criticism too is that People are seeing uh, Bill Peters and wondering if there's really that much of a difference if you look at the stat lines between Peters and uh, uh, Gullison. Um, but, you know, I think there is a lot of um, things to be said about the idea that he did lose the dressing room. You know, obviously he did have to throw the sticks and all that kind of hoo-ha that was going on and all that kind of drama. Um, so there is something there. There is something that's just not clicking with the players, it seems like from the outside, obviously we're not in the dressing room. We don't know what's going on. Um, and Peters seems to have a better reputation of, you know, getting some, you know, production out of players. Cause he had a pretty scant team in Carolina. So I think it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to this and what the players do being that this is, you know, for the core, for the majority of the core, this is like what their third coach. Um, yeah, it's a third under three. Yeah. So how many? Yeah, like how you know how many times can you blame it all on the coach when it starts getting to the players themselves and the leadership on the team? And I think uh, the big question coming into the season is how does the leadership and the core handle this season and the expectations? Yeah, it's and it's. I don't think it's like I don't think that this team. It's it's. It's not that this, the fan base is, for me anyway, I don't see the fan base clamoring for a, a Stanley Cup, but at least put in an effort. Yeah. Put I in, think the, the expectation of this team is to at least make the playoffs. Yes. Anything less than that is a huge disappointment yeah. in the game. Yeah. And and even if they may, didn't make the playoffs, but they there was a, like a fight in this team, which I felt like for most of the second half of the season, there wasn't a fight. I think some fans would be okay. At least we tried. Mm -hmm. But it just felt like there was a complete and utter collapse in some ways. And so it'll be interesting to see what Bill Peters does bring. I think one of the underrated moves, though, that was was the the hiring of Jeff Ward. I think he's going to be a big help. Uh, He was a guy with Boston. Uh, he's, He's got some innovative ideas on the power play. And I think he's going to be a very interesting. And look what he did with New Jersey. Taylor Hall got an MVP. I think he, he's he's a lot. He's done a lot. So I'm very interested to see what Jeff Ward brings to this table as well. Yeah, I think that'll be really interesting too. Especially anything that they can do to improve their power play because that was just woeful. That it was um, yes, it was hard. And that's one of the main you know, downfalls of the season was never being able to get that to click, no matter what was going on, that sort of thing. But uh, any improvement on that will definitely bolster the team and improve the team overall. So I think you, I agree with you on that. That's going to be the interesting, uh, you know, connection and stuff like that. Yeah. Then of course we get to the draft and of course we, the flames did not have a first round pick or a second round pick or a third round pick. Uh, there was a lot of angst in during the season when we were watching Travis Hamannick play and realizing that there's no first round pick and it turned out to be not a lottery protected pick, and it ended up being the eleventh pick in the draft. Yes. At the end of the day, big deal or no big deal? I'm gonna go with no big deal. I know there's a lot of people that are kind of disappointed that we didn't have that pick, especially what the Islanders did with those two picks that they had. Um, I can't remember the players they picked up, but uh, you know, a lot of analysts said that the Islanders were able to kind of win that first round with those two picks. Um, but I think it, what is one of those hindsight is 2020 items. Um, I think Hamannick is going to be a solid player for this team and a solid rock moving forward. Um, it'll be interesting to see how he does, uh, with Halifin, if that's the pairing that does happen. So I'm okay with that. Um, 
you know, it is a, I know a lot of people when you lose out on the first round pick and you're waiting for the summer and your team's on the playoffs, it's kind of the one thing you look forward to is the first round. And I think that may be clouding people's judgments and stuff like that. But I think for the time being, Hamannick, uh provides more than what maybe that first round draft would, you know, kind of provide. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot. I think I think Hamannick was put in a very unfortunate situation. Uh, I think there was never an opportunity for him to really adjust, and uh, and it, it's it was hard with the defense pairings. It's certainly, him and Brody didn't connect, but mm-hmm. you know, I I, I mean. Noah Hannafin, Oliver Wallstrom were the two picks, and yeah, they're going to be good players. Are the is it like franchise altering? I I don't necessarily think so. It was a 12, 11 to twelfth pick. I think I think Hamnick will be here for a while, and I think he's going to make a lot of contributions with the Flames. So I'm not necessarily all that upset about yeah. that. I'm with you too on that one. I think also you have to, it's a hindsight 2020. Um, nobody really expected the Flames to bomb out last year. Like they were expected to be in the playoffs, maybe for second round. Um, that was the expectation. So having a, you know, that's the gamble you take to try and get players of that caliber. Um, so, you know, it's easy to say in hindsight, but I think, you know, most people thought this was a good trade, like a strong play. And, you know, the Flames defense on paper looked phenomenal last year. Now, it didn't turn out that way, but obviously the addition to Hamnick was kind of a big deal in that kind of world. So I think it's worthwhile. Yeah, and sometimes you have to do, as we watched today, you have to make a bit of a gamble if you're going to move forward. And, <laughs> yes. and, and that's just what it, and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. And that was one of the cases where it looks like it, doesn't but if, if Hamannick steps up and has a better year this year, I think people will be like, okay, you know. Oh yeah, I think people will move on from that pretty quickly. Yeah. There will be a few people that will keep bringing it up as what what could have been type thing, but uh, you know that's something that's totally different too, right? Like you know, if it came and the Flames still had that 11th pick, would they have chosen you know the one of the players that the Islanders got? That's still up for debate, right? Yeah. So Yeah. There's yeah, there's no science to that. There's no exact science to that. Yeah, and, and and you know, a lot of people don't bring this up, and I'm not saying that this would have been a fair trade. But if we didn't, if the Flames, I gotta stop saying we. I'm trying, I'm trying to be objective <laughs> here. But if the Flames didn't tr- trade for Dougie Hamilton and kept that first round pick, they might have got Matthew Barzell. Yeah, that's true. And I don't. That I guess that's a. Interesting little question if you – how that dominoes fall. I mean, would people be – what would people be thinking about a a Backlund, Monaghan, Barzell forward shirt? Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, too, who knows if, you know, Barzell flows out, you know, comes together as quickly in the flame system as he did in New York with the opportunities that he got. So those are kind of the rough things that, you know – I know a lot of people love to talk about, you know, oh, we could have picked this guy, we could have picked that guy, but, you know, it's all kind of a hindsight thing. Um, and it, there's so many different factors when it comes to players and how they meld with a team. Do they, you know, work in with the, uh, you know, do they even work in the system? Like, I think one of the interesting ones now with the trade, and this might be a leeway into uh, the, this next topic, is, uh, you know, with, Lindholm on the team now. You've got Lindholm and Monaghan, and during that draft, you know, those were the two players that the Flames were rumored to be picking. Um, you know, and people were, there was a, a half a faction that really wanted, you know, Lindholm, and then the other faction that wanted Monaghan. Um, and, you know, you could say that Monaghan has definitely been the better player overall since that draft, right? So it's interesting that way. Yeah, that's, yes, that's. That's true. Yes. Let's get into, although not making a splash in their, or not making a draft pick, a first round pick, draft pick, they did make the biggest splash in the draft by uh, trading Dougie Hamilton and Michael Furland, along with Adam Fox, a uh, top, considered a top prospect in the Calgary Flames organization in terms of his ability. Uh, the reality was, is, is, and Brad Tree even said this, the likelihood that he was going to sign with the Flames was slim and none. 
Uh, traded to Carolina, Bill Peters' former team for, as mentioned, Elias Lindholm and Noah Hannafin. What were your thoughts on the trade? Initially, I was kind of skeptical. Um, it was kind of a shock. Um, but over time, and as I've kind of let it digest, I think this is a really positive trade for the Flames. And I think it's going to really change the team dynamics. I think, uh, to me, Noah Hanneflin is the really the star that the Flames got in that. I think that guy is going to be a steward on the Flames D for a few years. Um, I'm excited to see how Lindholm does. Um, I think that'll be an interesting dynamic, that one. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think the initial reaction everyone was talking about at the time was the best player in this trade is Dougie Hamilton. And since Dougie Hamilton was the one in the trade, Carolina got the better of it. I think at the end of the day, I'm wondering if we don't say that Noah Hannafin is the better one. And I, this is no disregard to who Dougie Hamilton is. He is a very talented defenseman. He 20 goals. Oh, no question. There is no question about this guy's size and ability and what this guy can be. But there were also times, and I go back to the game in March against San Jose when Evander Kane undressed him. Like, <laughs> undressed him. And <laughs> nothing like... There was times, like, they don't do this stat, Connor, but here's, here's a stat I would love to know. Who leads the league in any in bad penalties in the third period? I believe that Dougie Hamilton would be up there. Him and probably Sam Bennett are up there. Yes, it, yes, exactly, in terms of that, yeah. But, but there's no, like, so there's, we, I don't think there's ever been any question about the talent of Dougie Hamilton, but just... Oh, he's a talented player for sure, without question. But, I think anyone who says that he isn't talented is just crazy. Yeah. He is a definitely a talented player. And, you know, I, I agree with you that at the time, he is probably the best player in the trade. But at the same time, you know, how the Flames performed, there needed to be some kind of shakeup with the core. And he's kind of the most expendable of them. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he does in Carolina. Like, I think he's going to be a good player, but I don't think he's going to be a game breaker in Carolina. Who knows? They, they, I think Carolina is just a total wild card team. So no, who knows what they're going to do next year, but I don't think he's going to be as strong in Carolina as he was in Calgary, even though he had a lot of you know holes in his game. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that could work in Dougie Hamilton's favor is he's not in a place where there's going to be a lot of spotlight on him about his every move and what he's doing on every play. But yeah. at the same time, he doesn't have Giordano beside him. Exactly. Which he, he's going to be the focal point of yeah. that defensive core. Yeah. And he never, he's not going to have his Zanino Chara beside him, which he played with before. So I think have it, that that's what's going to be interesting in Car- with him in Carolina. Michael Ferdinand is an interesting case because I, he was a guy that a lot of people really liked. His story is quite inspiring. Uh, I remember, of course, we have to remember Furlan's mom versus Eddie Lack's dad <laughs> yes. uh, during that series. But when he wasn't on Monaghan and Goudreau's line, he, he never was able to produce. Not at the same level. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you on that one. Like, I, I like Furlan. I, I, I think it's very hard to find anyone in Calgary who doesn't like him. Um, and I think he's a great story. And he's also one of those amazing asset management Types of stories. Uh, I can't remember what round he was drafted, like third, or fourth, or fifth round. Um, yeah. So to get twenty goals out of a fifth round player is pretty impressive for the Flames. So he's a great story that way. But if you look potential wise, even you know a Furland just for Lindholm straight up trade, you got to take Lindholm any time of the day over keeping Furland. Yes, and what I like about the option of Lindholm is he can play center or wing. You can put him on one of three lines. Yeah. I could see him with Monaghan and Goudreau. I could see him playing with Backlund. And I could see him with in a pairing of some kind with Jankowski, whether, oh. whoever is a set. Like, I can see any one of those three being a fit with him. I think that there's a lot of versatility. It brings in a lot of versatility to this team, which I don't think that's been around for a while. I think that one of the problems last year is it just felt like the same lines were going out. 
and there was no adjustment. And I think with with a guy like Lindholm, you can make some adjustments. And that, yeah, that's a really good point because you're right. I think a lot of last year, although um, I've kind of liked that change in the Flames lineup where there's kind of that those three pairings. You know, you had Monahan and Goudreau, um, you know, Backlund and Kachuk, but to Kachuk and Janikowski with uh, Bennett. And those are kind of exciting to see which one would kind of take over a game. Um, but you're right. Like there were some games where all three of them really did struggled. You know, it'll be interesting to see if you can switch up Neil and Lindholm on those lines and see if that'll, you know, adjust and get a different spark going, right? So I think that'll be interesting to see. What do you think of this idea that Matthew could check going on the right wing? I think that's a cool idea. I think it's a good idea. Like, for the top line or second did, line? Did, or? Bill Peters said he was thinking about the idea of putting Kachuk with Monaghan and Gutro. I think that's, that's a, that'll be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, I think it's... You know, I think there's with the potential of Neil there too. Like, I thought, yeah. you know, on paper, Neil seems like the guy that would be the um, perfect fit for them. You know, maybe with uh, Lynn Holm on a second line type thing. But uh, you know, there is a, a lot of potential if you put Kachuk on there. That first line would be insane. <laughs> it would be a really a fast and fun. Yes. Line to watch play if it clicked. And he would create a lot more room for Monahan and Goodrich. Just by the way, he. He plays like it or not. He is a, a, a spit disturber, and I know that there's people out here that don't like him. You should have picked him. Just saying, yep. but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think one of the things too, the line of that caliber would also draw a ton of penalties. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then you could do. Uh, I mean, we were intending to go with the goaltenders, but I mean, then your next line could be a Backlund Lindholm, which I do feel ultimately would be a really good combination, and a James Neal on the left. Yeah, uh, and then my my third line is Jankowski, Bennett, and Froelich. I think one of the things that I also liked about the two, the the forward moves overall, even the signer to James Neal was. It does move Froley to a third line. I don't. I see him more as a third liner now. Not that like the guy. I love Froelich for what he does, but I think having him on the third line works. Um, I think he can help. A, I think a guy like Yager, when Yager left, it felt like Jankowski and Bennett took a bit of a. Well, Bennett didn't really have a step up, but certainly. Felt like Jen Yager helped Jankowski and Bennett, and I think for a leak on that line would help Jankowski and Bennett. Go yeah, on. I fully agree with that. And I think Froelich's kind of a funny player on the team now. I think he's kind of the forgotten forward. Um, yeah. most people don't even talk talk about him anymore. But he's still, you know, him and Backlund have been producing fairly well for the past few years. You know, and Froelich is still. But call correctly, he's still a steward on the penalty kill, which I think is a key element, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that'll be interesting if he's back on the third line. That might that would definitely you know give some uh, you know confidence to even a Ben and Janikowski if that ends up being the third line if they still play together in that line by uh, you know the start of the season type thing. But I think that'll be interesting, and I agree with you. I think for a league on the third line is a lot better than putting him in a pressure situation to be that secondary scoring. And also, I might, I, I'm, I'm 20% certain of this. I think that there is, I'm going to make this a bold statement. I think that there is a small, as high as 20% possibility that Sam Bennett does not start with the regular, with the big club. I think that there is a possibility Ooh. they send him down. Interesting. I don't have any evidence of that. <laughs> but I, or I don't have like any sources not. of that, but I think that was one of the things that I think really bothered to go back to Gullitz. And I think the things that were really frustrating were how did Bennett keep getting on the ice and a guy like guarded Hathaway couldn't, when he took a bad penalty, he was off. But when Sam Bennett took a bad penalty, he was back on. And I think that rubbed a lot of people, a lot of fans, the wrong way, and I'm really going to be interested to see how Bill Peters handles that. And I'm just, I, I, I have this feeling that there's a possibility, especially with the fact that they loaded this lineup. This there is a lot of forwards here. Like, yeah, and there's that's been one a of lot the struggles. Of, 
you, there's been a lot of talk about the overkill here in Vancouver about what's on the Canucks side here. This forward group, it's there is a lot. It's crowded. Yeah, like you st- it's really crowded because you know how do you even you know there's still like guys like Lazar like not that Lazar should be on the third line. I don't think he's really proved to that. But you know with Spencer Fu, um, the new addition Austin says Austin Zernick. Yeah, yeah. I'm never going to be able to say that correctly. But you know where do those guys slid in slide into things right? And what do you do with a Troy Brower? I mean, there was it it was called the Brower play for, for a long time. Uh, I was at times just assuming that Troy Brower, they just, Troy Brower just jumped on and like no one really stopped. Like, Troy, oh, okay, you're on. Okay, whatever. Can't, you know, <laughs> can't stop you there. Uh, but what do you do with, like, there is, there's a lot of pressure on Troy Brower coming into this camp, I think, to perform. I, I and I so and I do like so and I like the competition of what's happening in the forward. Yeah, I like it too. Um, I, I think Troy Brower is really going to be the big question whether or not he ends up being bought out or ends up on in the AHL or you know a reclamation project for some team that needs a little bit more um, veteran presence. Um, you know, I don't know enough about the dressing room, but again, he seems to be a guy that everyone likes in that dressing room. So. You know, what does that do to the team chemistry? Um, you know, and I, I think he is, because of his contract, he is a scapegoat. I don't think he brings enough to, like, warrant being on the first or second line or anything. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Brower um, this year coming up. Um, I'm of the belief, and you know, after watching kind of, like, the Knights, um, you know, teams like Columbus and even, you know, the Capitals to an extent, like, the, the league is getting so much quicker and so much younger now that it's – you have to question about some of these veteran presence signings that the flames tend to always, you know, fall back to, um, and whether they're not, whether it's worth even having them around sometimes. Right. So yeah. that's the question that I'd be curious about. Yeah. I will, I'll be curious about that too. Yeah. And yeah, with the, with the way that this league is moving for sure, it's, it's, it's younger and faster and, and I think it, you need to play that more of that two-way game. I'm going to be interested also in seeing what happens with a guy like Dylan Dubé, who had a really great camp last year. I think there's, I think there might be a chance he could have a good opportunity to make this team. I think he might be in a fight with Sam Bennett for a position. I could see that being a competition. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, no, I think... I- I think there's a couple guys that are knocking on the door, like a Klinchuk. Yeah. Um, I don't think he makes the team out of training camp, um, unless he just puts in an amazing effort. But I think he'll be one of those call-ups that, you know, eventually makes a question for the team itself. Um, you know, Spencer Fu is a guy that I'm interested to see how he does, too, um, just to see if he's able to stick with the team or if he ends up in the press box as kind of that, like, extra forward. But, you know, we're even forgetting about, too, that... Uh, one of the players the Flames got was Derek Ryan in the yeah, free agency, we, yeah. right? So you're right. This this um, forward roster is just jam packed with players, and it'll be interesting to see how it all shuffles out. There's got to be probably one or two more moves. You know, you've got a Garnett Hathaway too that has to fit into there somehow. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how it all folds together. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's that's going to be the the interesting part. Now let's let's go to the defense because with the move of Dougie Hamilton, we have assumed that this is the pairings that we've got. A more, I'm going to go uh, five, six, four, three, two, one for dramatic effect here. Sounds uh, good. We we're going to it will probably be either Rasmus Anderson, Michael Stone, and Brett Kulak battling for five, six, seven. Uh, Travis Hamannick and Noah Hannafin, the H's will be the 3-4. And Mark Giordano will be paired with TJ Brody. I'm cynical. I understand the idea because Brody is better on the right side than the left side. I'm worried about... And I don't... I think that a couple of things that need to be said here about Dougie Hamilton and TJ Brody. I do... There was talk about some personal issues with them 
there, I know, I don't know specifics. I'm not getting into that, but I know that TJ Brody has been dealing with stuff in his life. What that is, I, I don't know, but I, 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 it, it's been said by people that are following the flames that that's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and perhaps, perhaps he can get that cleared. And I just really, we're overall worried. I don't see Brody as an improvement to Hamilton. I know that he's, I, I, this is my prediction. If Rasmus Anderson shows well, there is a possibility at some point this season that TJ Brody is moved out. I'm still not see. convinced he's here for the full year. I could see that. I, I think when you look at the Flames roster, and especially you know with some of the prospects on defense um, D, um, he is kind of the expendable guy. Like I, I didn't think Hamilton was expendable. Like my my number one expendable player on the Flames, especially in the D core, was TJ Brody. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I, I'm with you if there is an opportunity I you know to improve the team in some other capacity I think you know maybe even in goaltending or something um I could see Brody being moved out um he just seems like you know it all I guess it all depends on how well him and Giordano click um I, I think the potential is still there like he's a fairly young guy still um he's shown some pretty strong you know play over the past few years the past the, the last couple of years have been a struggle for him I think for sure yeah, he because he had a, yeah. People forget that it was two years ago he struggled playing with Dougie Hamilton, and he struggled again with Travis Hamonic. And it could have been a, a a coaching thing, and maybe it'll be a better fit with Peters too. We don't know, but um, I think I'm going to reserve judgment, good or bad, about TJ Brody. I I hope it's a good combination. And all the other thing is too, and, and people have been talking a little bit about it. Gio's not getting any younger. Neither of us, all of us. But he's not getting any younger. And he has been playing at a high level. And I don't think it's not unreasonable to expect him to not be at a high level. But, again, but at the same time, there there could be a step back from Gio this year as well. I think it's expected. Like, there's going to be some point within the next two years that Gio starts making it, taking a step back. Um I think always the the hope is that at that point um, the Flames, you know, have enough mem- defensive strength that they take over for kind of like reducing some Geo's time and not making him the sole focal point of the defense itself. Yeah, yeah, and I think Hannafin he may not have he he may not be as great this year, but I think he'll be help especially with youth, and I think the development of Anderson. The, the youth on the defense, I think, is is interesting. Uh, and I, I still think there can be some changes there. Um, I know a lot of people are not high on Michael Stone. I, I think he probably ends up being a 7D. There's Dalton Prout who did sign a one-way, by the way. So I think they're trying to give him a shot as well. So uh, it, it's also kind of crowded back there as well, too, actually. It's, it's, it's not a... It's, there's especially some competitions for five, six, seven, eight on, on that team on the team as well. Oh, when training. Yeah, well, without question, is it? You know, we're we're getting about Clinton too, um, and Valimaki down in the farm. You know, yes. there's a lot of rumors that Valimaki might actually just make the team straight out of camp. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how it all flows. I think I'm with you though. I think if you know Brody struggles a bit, or there's an opportunity, I think he may be the first kind of defenseman out of town. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's get to goaltending, which, um, <laughs> you know, there's there's only been two great ones in Calgary, Mike Rick Vernon Wonder. and Mika Kiprasov, and Vernon was polarizing, so maybe the best, there's, there's been only one, and it's Mika <laughs> Kiprasov, but... Um, I think sure changing Roman Turek in his uh, 24 game stint there, my friend. Yes, that was one of the, and Freddie ba- Brathwaite had a great run for a while. Oh, I miss Freddie Brathaway. Yeah, he was it was fun. And <laughs> Reggie Lemelin. Oh yes, the classic Reggie Lemelin. Yes. Uh, but how are we feeling about the goaltending? I think you know. I think Smith is going to 
do he's going to produce another solid year. I'm not worried about the goaltending. I'm not thinking this is going to be a, you know a Talbot situation in Edmonton where you know Smith had a really good first year as a Flame uh, before the injury. I, I obviously, everything fell apart after that for the whole season. But I think he's going to be fine this year, and I think he's going to play enough, play well enough to get them into um, a situation where they have they're in the playoffs. Uh, the big question, I think, is the year after. Um, like, I think Gillies should be... I, I think he's pretty much behind on where I think everyone would be comfortable with his development. Like, he was looked at as, as the goaltender of the future. I know there's a couple in the pipeline. Uh, Parsons is one that keeps getting battered about, about being a goaltender of the future and stuff like that. So I, I think it's after this year, things get a little iffy on the Flames goaltending situation. Well, it's interesting to be how they signed the Gillies contract because they signed it as a two-way this year and a one-way next year. So it's almost like they have they are expecting bigger things from him. Okay, you're developing this year, but next year we need more from you. Yeah, and uh, I fully agree with that. Yeah, you know, I think I, I'm one. I'm kind of with you. I think. I definitely do think we need to get 30 games from a backup that's not from someone not named Mike Smith. Yeah. And I think having a 60 game workload, I don't think works with, for him. Um, and I think we got to see these kids get the, we, these guys, whether it's Riddick or Gillies or Parsons, one of these guys has to step up and, and take that backup job. I fully agree with you, and that's one of the biggest struggles that the Flames have had really since Kiprasov left is obviously the revolving door goaltenders, but they haven't been able to develop internally any goaltenders that have really been able to become anything. Like, you know, obviously there's Curtis McLaney and a couple other ones that ended up being backups, but, you know, for all the all the potential and the, you know, the hype of some of these goaltenders, like Gillies is a great example, um, you know, he's been pretty much pegged with the Flames goaltender of the, you know, the future since uh, until they drafted tar- Tyler Parsons um, for a while now, but he just has not been able to take that next step, right? You know, and even at Mason McDonald when he was drafted, he was a potential goaltender of the future, and he's kind of fallen off the face of the earth too. So that's one of the biggest struggles with this team, I think. Yeah, and over the years, and the only one that really re- – the only draft pick that has – consistently stayed in the NHL. The only Calgary Flames goalie draft pick that has consistently stayed in the NHL is Mike Vernon. Yeah. That, it, it, like, look it up. Like, Mika Kippersoff was not a Flames draft pick. He was a, a San Jose pick. He did. Yeah. Roman Turek was not a Flames draft pick. He was tra- a trade yeah. from the St. Louis Blues. Reggie Lemelin was a trade as well from the Philadelphia Flyers, I believe. Donnie Edwards, another number one, was also a trade. Grant yeah. Fuhr, when he was a number one, his course was with the Oilers. And, and Jaguar, again, from Jay- Carolina. Yeah, well, well yeah, and Jaguar, Jaguar was a flame. Jaguar and Trevor Kidd, but they never really, they never really, Jaguar, I guess, got a consmite. Okay, so, yeah, but the only one that really, the only Flames draft pick, only successful Flames draft pick goalie that has stuck with this franchise has been Mike Vern. Yeah, without question. And that is, like, I'm listening out here. I listen to a lot of Vancouver radio. I'm sure you do too. But there's been such a talk about the Vancouver D, and they have they haven't picked up that awesome defenseman. The Flames have never been able to draft a goalie. No, it's been one of their biggest struggles, and it, it doesn't matter what they do, uh, they just cannot produce any kind of goaltender. Like you look at some of the other teams in the league, like Anaheim. The Capitals, you know, those clubs that have just been able to be a pipeline for goaltender development, even San Jose, uh, for whatever reason, the Flames have just struggled. But, you know, in fairness, too, like, not like Edmonton's done the, that well either in the past few years or Toronto. So, well, no, <laughs> it's it's, one it, of those it, mysteries it, that never will, no one will ever figure out. Yeah. I'm convinced Evan Bouchard will play center for the Oilers at some point. <laughs> I'm, I'm just convinced of that. Um, Kitty Noyley fans, but some of you probably think that too. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, but it's so it, it is something that the Flames need to 
really solidify at some point in time. And it's not that they have, you're right, Connor. It's not that they haven't drafted them. It's, nope. it's somewhere within this, this development of him. Yeah. And there's been a few, even ones that they brought over from Europe, um, you know, just uh, like Ramo, uh, Kari Ramo. Uh, what was the other guy too, that got traded to Colorado a couple years ago? Um, you know, they all seem to have potential and then it just does not work out. So it'll be interesting to see if the if Gillies can turn it around or Parsons can actually, you know, fulfill the potential that they've been kind of showing and showcasing. So that'll be fascinating. I think that's going to be the biggest question mark coming into next season, not this season coming up, but the next season, um, you know, what the flames are going to do again with goaltending. And, that, and that's a big issue because they're, you know, if they don't have an internal solution, whether it's re-signing Smith or giving the keys over to Gillies or Riddick or something, then they've got to spend more assets to find something that's suitable, right? And that's that's a detriment to the team moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Because you can't keep trading for them. You have to, at some point, have one. And you look around this division... You, there is, there, like, one of the things that I don't know, like, the Flames can I think that this division generally, I, I think it's fair to say that the Golden Knights are still favored to win this division. I'm I, with you that, 100%. The Golden Knights would be my favorite. I, I, think, I lo- think a lot of people are still discounting them and saying, oh, it's just a one-year wonder. But the way they play, the way they bought into the system, the way the players love that city... I don't know how you can see any possibility of them not being the favorite to win the division this year, but then it's kind of a toss up after that. But and but you look at San Jose, they got Martin Jones who's a good goalie, yeah. you got the LA Kings with Jonathan Quick. Um I think one of the step backs for the Oilers was that Cam Talbot got hurt and they did not get a backup. And if Talbot is healthy, I think the Oilers are better. Uh you've got um is it Gibson and Anaheim? Gibson and Anaheim. Um, Vancouver is a mess in goal. Um, they're <laughs> hoping for someone, but I mean, Arizona is is Arizona is going to be better this year. I'm not saying that they're a playoff team, but they are going to be better this year. They are not yeah. going to be the disaster that they've been. So they need some really good goaltending to be. I think. In, in the playoffs. So if you were to answer the poll question, which yes. team will be better? A hundred percent. Without question. I, I don't... Like, last year was such a disappointment. Um, when I look back at it, I think it kind of is a karmatic um, evening out for that season that they made the playoffs under Hartley uh, when they really shouldn't have. Yeah. Um, so I think it, in the development of the team... It evens out from the one year they should have made it, the, play, the one year they shouldn't have made the playoffs. This is the year that they should have made the playoffs and they missed out. Um, so I think anything like getting into the playoffs, I think, is a, pretty much a guarantee for this team. Um, anything after that is going to be a disappointment. But just, just looking at the team on paper, even if there's questions on, in that, um, I think they will make the playoffs without question. Okay. I am still not quite there. I think you look at the Central, it's going to be tough. Because you got Nashville, Winnipeg. St. Louis is going to be interesting. I don't know about Minnesota. I think Chicago's a complete mess of a team. Yeah. And I think Dallas is the most overhyped, overrated team in the NHL right now. I think that this is one of those teams that I think people are... I don't know what people are seeing in the Dallas Stars. I think even with Eric Carlson... I don't see them as a contender. Mm-hmm. I don't. And I I'm, agree with you that. Like, I think when you look at the Western Conference, uh, you've got like Winnipeg, Nashville, um, and what was the other team in the Central that I? But yeah, Winnipeg, and Nashville are guaranteed. You know, one of the top three spots in the Central. Um, I think Minnesota is going to be a mess. Um, yeah. They're either going into full rebuild or they're going to coast along. But, you know, with the new GM in place, he's got to put a stamp on the team pretty quickly. Um, have they made a move this offseason? I don't think they have, to be honest. <laughs> I was trying so to do some quiet. research beforehand, but I haven't seen anything. Um, they're, in a t- they're a team that just, you know, has been coasting and really needs a cleaning of the house, right? They're... Um... They're a lot like the Calgary Flames in a lot of ways. There's just, man, 
I don't think I think when people talk, think about the Minnesota Wild outside of Flame, outside of Wild fans, there's a meh. They're the Minnesota yeah. Wild. They're, they're a weird team. I, I don't think they're in the same. I think the Flames are still building on. Like they're yeah, the Flames are young enough and with enough potential that they are growing into this and will become a contender in the future here. But the Wild, there's just really nothing to get excited about. Yeah. Um, and they they were a team that you know people were banking on being a contender for years once they signed Sutter and once they got Parise. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Dubnik came into his own, but they really cannot make any heads or tails. Um, team's getting older. Um, they're not getting the superstars that you really need to push a team into the future type thing. So they're a weird team. It'll be interesting to see how they flow together. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that will be interesting. Although Bruce finds a way, Bruce Boudreau finds a way to get wins in the, <laughs> in the regular Boudreau. season anyway. Dropping the F-bombs, he'll get them going. <laughs> yes, that's true. Drop an F-bomb, Bruce. You're going to have to drop some F-bombs. <laughs> you know, the other thing that I will get into, and, and the, there's been a lot of talk about what happens, you know, in the East, Um Tavera siding in the Leafs, that's a power change. And the possibility that Eric Carlson is going to land up in Tampa Bay, where that puts that team. And I'll admit that that's a pretty damn... If Eric Carlson ends up in Tampa Bay, that's a pretty damn scary team. But it's almost like we forgot that someone won the Stanley Cup last year, (laughs) Connor. Aren't the Washington Capitals... Can you follow them as well? Yes, I'm a huge Capitals fan. This is a team that somehow has just fallen under the radar. Yeah, and I think it's because of. I think when you look at the Capitals, you have to look at the context of their. Ever since Ovechkin and that back and Backstrom, the first year they made the playoffs, uh, where they went up against Montreal, uh, I can't, almost ten years ago now, I think it is, uh, and the excitement from then, and then the story of. You know, everything, all the failure and disappointment until this season where they just went on the miraculous run. Because, you know, one of the things I was joking about was, um, you know, when the playoffs were starting off, I wasn't that interested because the Flames were good to beat. The Flames were, didn't make it and the Capitals would be out in the second round, guaranteed. And then they won and kept winning. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think they're an underdog team. Um, I still th- don't think they're their favorite. I think my personal opinion is Pittsburgh is probably a favorite to win out of the East. Um, You know, I think it's funny that you bring up Tampa Bay and the potential of getting Carlson. Um, You know, I think the Capitals are actually an example of sometimes that doesn't actually work out in the best way. You know, when the Capitals went all in almost two years ago with Shattenkirk and failed to make it out of the second round. I think that's maybe, you know, something that Tampa Bay might be struggling with is the expectations of winning. Um, And it's something that Washington struggled with for years, the expectations of winning. And then once those expectations disappeared, they were able to play their game properly. You know, for the as much as we've mocked, this is something that is we had this. Kind of, I had this debate with someone else on a different podcast, um, and I know we're, we're not going to get into the Tavares too much because we talked a lot about that. But I do want to. I've pointed this out. We John Tavares has not gotten past the second round in his playoff career. Yeah. And Alex and everyone was like, well, it's a team game and, you know, some of his teams aren't great. And, you know, we have never given Alex Ovechkin that grace. He never no. got that grace. And he was, never got that because I think there was that famous gif of um, him floating in the background with a controller not connected symbol in front of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, like he just, he's never gotten that grace. It's always been on his shoulders. And you can see at the end of last season that it just, it tore almost like there's a great Washington post article that recaps the entire year. Um, you can find it online. Um, and it breaks down everything that team went through. And, you know, like last season when they came into training camp, they were just a zombie team. They just, there was no motivation in that team because they were so defeated from all the pressure that they had to endure over the past seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think Ovechkin's one of those guys that I think he doesn't get the credit. He's gotten the blame, but he doesn't get the same credit for that or the same grace that we've given other 
players. And I want to, you know, the other thing, as much as we love Tampa Bay and everybody has been in falling in love in Tampa Bay, what have they really done the last few years? They've won to one cup final. They went to the Eastern Conference final last year, but they missed the playoffs the year before. Yeah. This is not a team that has... This team has been talked about talent-wise as one of the best talented teams in the league. But they have kind of are in that one. Mitch talked and I talked about that. But Washington, Tampa Bay is falling in that, has the potential to fall in that Washington capital trap a bit. Oh, I fully agree with that. And I think they're already well into that. Um, you know, I think there's questions coming of Stamkos already. Uh, even when, you know, the Capitals eliminated them. There was real big questions of whether or not Stan Pocos is actually, you know, is he a playoff performer and that sort of thing? Because there's questions about that. So I think they're starting to fall into the trap that the Capitals had and struggled with for years. And it's going to take a moment. It's going to take one season where everything falls together um, and they make, you know, make the finals, you know, either win or push it to seven games for people to not question them anymore. Yeah. And, the hype, I think, for favorites in this league is really difficult to shake. Yeah, I think it, it's 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 true. I think like, because I think it's we we spend so much time on them, and I think Toronto's going to start to experience that a little bit with with Tavares and higher expectations. Tampa Bay is going to feel it, even though they're not in a market that's necessarily super hockey crazed the nhl is starting to become crazed about them what washington has taught we talked about that pittsburgh even went through it with crosby they even went through that before they went through their back-to-backs right they've they had their exactly own. and I, I think that's a big thing too is that you know expectations for pittsburgh like i don't think many people are calling them stanley cup you know favorite that would they would be my stanley cup favorite i think um, getting bounced out in the second round, giving them t- players time to recuperate and get their energy back and that sort of thing. Um, but the expectations, you know, in their second season weren't to, you know, take the cup. It was, you know, Washington was going to do it or Tampa was going to do it, right? Yeah. 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 It, it's it's tough to win in this league. And, I mean, you know, I mean, Vegas will feel pressure, but I think it's it's that's going to be fine. Nashville felt a little bit of pressure. Um, Winnipeg is going to feel some pressure of being the same. So it's it's not it's not easy to be successful in this league. There's there is things. It's hard. It's hard to yeah. win the Stanley Cup. Well, and even if you look at the Flames, two thousand three, two thousand four, when they made that run, the expectations from that series that dogged you know pretty much the entire the remainder of Ginla's career in the Flames uniform. Yeah, it's hard to shake that. You know, they're the Flames can't get past the first round. They're choking that sort of thing, right? So it, it's really difficult in this league with expectations. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 interesting. One time we'll have to do a podcast on how to so around the psychology of sports success. <laughs> that would be a fascinating one because it you know I mean you even look at. At something like what what happened with the Seahawks a couple of years ago, they've never really recovered from that play. Yeah, exactly. You know? never shook it off. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's tough. I mean, the Red Sox for years had trouble recovering from that Bill Buckner play. The Chicago Cubs for years, like like it's there's something that the sports psychology would be a, would be a fascinating podcast to deal with. Oh, it'd be incredible. Yeah. Is there anything else we need to talk about NHL wise? Or I don't think so. I think the season is going to be really interesting for the Flames in general. Um, I'm uh, I, I'm expecting at least to make the playoffs. Hopefully to make the win a round. Uh, if they don't, I think it, I don't think it's the end of the world. Um, I still view this season as a growing season for the core. Yeah. Um, and I think the big question is going in for the Flames. I think is how that core of Monahan. Goudreau, Chuck, Bennett, Jankowski, uh, Giordano to an extent. Um, you know, how they are they able to finally get over this mental hump and start playing the way that they look like they should be playing on paper? Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's, it's a big step for the core uh, this year. Um, the talent is there. No one's going to dispute that. Uh, you know, I think 
Tree overall has done a pretty good job. Some question, some questionable moves, but who hasn't made any questionable moves? Uh, it's just it's time for this team to put it together, and it's really I think time for this the players on this team to put it together and not like, ah, it's the coach again. It, like, yeah, I, I don't think it can be blamed on the coach anymore. Like yeah. if the, if there's another, you know, fail of the season coming up here, um, it's clearly not the coach and it's definitely something within this core. Um, but when you look at the core, I don't see a core that's got issues. Um, you know, I don't think it's the Edmonton Oilers. Um, it's a team that needs that take that next step and they need to learn how to take that next step. And sometimes that comes with failure, like not making the playoffs motivates you. You see what you need to do to make it into the big show every year. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the teams, the young players like this need to get into that level. And I think there's uh, the toughest thing for the flames, is the high expectations playing in a hockey market in Canada. Um, and whether or not the fans will have patience for them to keep growing. But I think they're on the verge of it this year. So it'll be interesting to see how it all comes together. Yep. Uh, what are you personally up to? Tell us some of the things you're up to out in the land uh, of Burnaby. You know, not much. I'm actually personally taking a bit of time off from, uh, I was heavily involved in politics for a couple of years there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm personally taking some time off that. I'm still tweeting at CT Overdrive on Twitter. Uh, and still running my web design company and kind of just moving forward in that aspect. So, Yes, this, this hockey stuff has been a real help for me to not necessarily always be in, in politics. And Alberta politics continues to be fascinating. BC politics continues to be fascinating. But that's for a different – that's for a completely different podcast. It's, I it's, agree. I fully agree with that one. <laughs> it's, and it's, it's nice to talk about something different and have something a bit of different – Angle. Exactly. Sports is uh, sometimes it can be annoying, but sometimes it can be actually a nice breath of fresh air once yeah. you're faced with some other things. So it's great, man. Yes. Uh, follow me, KVOLE, SoundCloud, KVOLE, YouTube, Spreaker, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Thanks for coming on, man. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Looking right. forward to chatting more in the future, buddy. Yes. We will have you on again. We will talk to you all very soon. Bye for now.